Okay, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jacob Greenspan, and I'm honored to be one of ex Danny, uh, Danny students. As you can easily notice, I'm not used to speaking English. So whenever I say something that you won't understand, raise your hand and say, hey, what did you mean to say? Uh, following Peretz Lavi, I know that it's a good time for taking a nap. Um, but this is my younger daughter, and this is the older. So it's dead show now. So I'll try, I'll try do my best to keep you all awake. It's not going to be easy. Um, and I wanted to present the power practical side of cognition. Not that I said that academic world is not practic, by no means. But I'm going to talk about three stations, three steps in my life, which are connected to Danny and the, prof and the cognitive science. And the first two will be very short. The third one will be longer. So do you know this guy? Anybody here? OK. Uh, Angelo Mosso, a physician, an Italian physician by the years 1846 till early uh, previous century. He actually built the first all wooden made MRI system. This is what he's done. He took subjects, placed them on a bench, and balanced the bench. Then he gave them a very uh, complicated task, at least for me, 17 divided by 4 is something I can't do. And all of a sudden, what he found out is that it bent it toward the head. It's a free translation by Google here saying, what is this crazy doctors want from me? Everybody is familiar with Italian? So I can write whatever I want. OK. And <laughs> I really doubt this experiment, but it's something very nice about uh, uh, the rush of the blood to the head. Um, but the way, as can be easily noticed, even that days, all subjects were students. You can see shorts, t-shirt, I mean, OK, never mind, forget that. Um, <laughs> even at 8088, whatever it was. OK, so ever since, whenever there's a rush of blood to the brain, it means that the brain works. It means that I have some work over there. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. OK, I'll take some air. Yep, my first life is the safety above all. When I have graduated here um, in Danny's lab, he suggested to uh, me that I open a unit that will uh, simply take the body of research that is being discovered here and make it into practical projects in the industry, actually all about safety. So I have established a little unit here under Danny's, and this is its name. I do apologize for all um, English speakers only. I'll switch to Hebrew. I take a long breath and read it out loud. The name of the unit was היחידה ליישום מחקרי במרכז המחקר לבטיחות בעבודה והנדסת אנוש בתמיכתה ובמימונה של עבודה לפעולה מונעת ומחקר בבריאות בעבודה של יד משרד העבודה והרווחה. אוקיי, דני, could you translate it for the English native speakers, please? No, you don't want to. אוקיי. אוקיי, it means that we are making project in the safety world and this is an example. This is a galvanization bath. It contains a 900 degrees plus melted zinc, Celsius, OK? It is really, really hot. Now, your friend, you are here. And your friend is here. And you want to tell him something. What would you do? It's a, loud, it's a really noisy um, uh, planet. So any reasonable man would go all around this 900 degrees bath and go and speak to the other guy. Any further suggestions by you? Yes, exactly what you think. They simply jump over the bath. OK? Um, I don't believe that the planet will invest the money to take you out of that. I mean, if you fall inside. And this is something that people do. They just go a few steps back, run, and jump over this 900 de degrees. <laughs> yep. This means that people are good in nature. I mean, they want to be good employees. They want to be constructive to the planet, so they jump over it. Unbelievable, but they do that. And this kind of stuff we had to deal with. Uh, I do apologize for all of the people who come from the States. This is Israel. Welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah. I won't, don't believe that in the States somebody would jump over this bath, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, OK, so this is my first step, and we made lots and lots of projects there. And actually, it was a, a real pleasure to do that. Uh, because whenever we discovered something in the lab or something which is any practical um, um, implement, implementation, I took it and tried to make a project out of this. It was very nice. My second life, in which I'm going to speak very briefly, is UI. As can easily noticed, it's a user interface. 
It's a company I have established with Dr. Gil Rupert Graf, He's sitting over there, and other Danis Gophers ex-students. Uh, actually, I should say ex-partner, or should I say I'm his ex-partner because I left the company and he's still running it. But it's a company it turned out to be the biggest company in Israel, about 50 employees, which is kind of big. And we are making user interface. We're trying to make people life easier. Here is an example to one of who didn't call us. Since I know it's noon time, you're all, uh, all very tired. Please raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand and dial your home number on the screen. Come on, Israel, just do it. Yeah, just do it. Try to do it. Okay, it's unbelievable, right? Okay, do you see that? Dial, do that. Okay. Actually, um, it took me half an hour to get out of this gas station. I wanted to enter my ID number. That's what he's asked me to, and I couldn't realize why all the numbers turns wrong till I. Where this tilted thing. So these are things that UI does not do. However, am I shouting? Yes, I'm shouting. Never mind. Okay. Um, but this is kind of projects uh, typically in the in the software world. And this is another example of how we make try to make users happy. This somebody took me the pictures from a traffic jam in, jam in Germany. Seven kilometers, six kilometers. Five kilometers, <laughs> three kilometers, and off we go. Okay. <laughs> now this is very important. I mean, it can be very disturb. Oh, you're all awake at half past two. That's nice. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. Don't worry. I'll let you fall asleep in a short time. Um, and be ready. We're going to dance together. So, if somebody wants to go to, oh, never mind. Forget that. Okay. Um, since I left, I'm much more interested in the UX and you not the UI. UX is user experience. This is the little daughter that you saw over there on the first slide, but she grew up. And one of them, it's a totally true story. By the way, anything I tell now is a completely true story. OK. Um, and she came from the kindergarten and told me, Daddy, I want to go to Paris. It's a real story. And I asked her, OK, Nat, why do you want to go to Paris? And she said, I want to see the Eiffel. And I asked her, OK, what is the Eiffel? And she didn't know. But she told me this sentence. There's an iPhone, there's an iPod, and there's an Eiffel. OK? Yeah. True. Completely true story. This little kid, this four years old kid, knows exactly that something that starts with I something is all about fun. Well, that's nice. Yes, it's all about fun. Uh, so she wanted to go to see the Eiffel Tower, maybe next year. Don't believe so. Um, she'll be very disappointed to find out it's not something that you hold in your hand. And the minute it falls down, it breaks, and you have to pay another 600 bucks. <laughs> but maybe that's OK. So this is the second station of my life, uh, which is a UI, user interface uh, design company. Another example of using the rush of blood to the head or actually cognitive science. And I th really thank Danny for that. But don't think that I have finished, because I'm just thinking Danny is just the middle. OK. Uh, so now I want to get into the, my main body of my uh, uh, talk today. This is my third life, ACE, Applied Cognitive Engineering. This is ACE. It's drawer. It's me. A little, little depressed, right? Uh, no, am I? OK. Danny Dankner, the manager, Anat, and Ben. Look at Ben. He's a really good looking guy, right? OK, never mind, girls. OK, and what we are doing over there is actually cognitive, design, uh, cognitive uh, trainers. We make the cognitive trainer, and we are now in the sports, of, in the sports business of uh, basically um, basketball and mostly ice hockey. Now I want to speak briefly about cognitive trainer because um, it do inform me that not everybody here is a cognitive scientist or so know exactly what is, it, what is it all about. Um, do I want to talk about it now? No, I don't want to talk about it now. OK, we'll keep on with that. OK, cognitive trainer. Let's take, for example, a gym. That you go to the physical gym and you weight, raise lay, weights. Okay? If you raise weights, your muscles becomes, become stronger. Now, going to another environment, you can simply perform the task better. For, for example, if I raise weight and I'm becoming stronger with my hand, I can later on, I don't know what, um, Run my bicycle better, OK? I wasn't training on the bicycle task. I was training on waiting left. Uh, wait, sorry. But then I become a better, uh, um, a better performer in the task I wanted to. This is exactly what we're doing in ACE. We actually train users or players' brain in a computer video-like game system. Following that, when they go to the ice, they play much better. 
and I'm going to explain about this in a br uh, briefly. Uh, I'm sorry. Bah, OK. I have two a picture of the space for twist. Mine is better. It has better colors and much more sharp. OK. Do you have, is the one following me, do you have the space for twist picture? OK. I have the best one. Um, is there anyone here not familiar with the space for twist? Oh, cool. So I explain if it's short, in a short time. OK. But the, the space for twist is actually a game. It's a, old arcade game, so if I'm insulting anybody, it's a really old arcade day, game. There's a, a, in the middle, there's a forest, a foster first. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. It's because I have a slide of forest gump at the end. So, OK. It's after come conflict. The dynamic really after come conflict. OK. Now it shoots uh, missiles on you, and this is you. And you have to avoid, it looks like the peace, but peace mark, but never mind. And you have to avoid hitting by the, OK? And you have to escape mines, and you have to maneuver all around and really be good at that. And this is a project, uh, I think it was by DARPA, with many laboratories took uh, part all around the globe. And there was a competition over there. Um, I call it a competition, probably it wasn't a competition, to see what is the best training method or system that could work. But this is not the case, the most important for us. Part of the experiment done by Danny here in Israel was done in the Israeli Air Forest. These are the planes. This is not the planes, that's a picture of planes. OK. And actually, what he was doing over there is training uh, flight cadets in the Israeli Academy for in the Air Forest. And surprisingly or not, they fly much better later on. Flight is not the correct word. Forget it. OK. They, could be, they were able to fly the planes much better later on. Why is that so? Because part of the cognitive skills needed to this space fortress can be used while flying. Now, if I play with this very simple game and I enhance my abilities to perform the task, then when I get to the real situation, I will fly my jet plane much better. And actually, much better is this number. This is a huge number. This are, it can go up to 30% better uh, uh, chance to finish the, uh, the course. It can go to this number in improving your flight abilities. This is something really, really uh, impressive. And this is actually, I think, the first cognitive trainer ever, ever made, right, Danny? I think it's the first cognitive trainer ever made on Earth. And this is really a, 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 a visionary idea. And till that day, this is what we had to do. If you wanted to train somebody, you should put him inside a real simulator. Now, a real simulator costs a lot of money. It has its problem of its own. But we can train the brain without training the task. This is something that really, really can make us good. And this is cool, right? OK, if anybody thinks it's cool, it only means that he's a nerd like me. I mean, but it's really cool. No, I mean, it's, it's really fantastic. And we are now getting into ACE, OK? S is a company which makes uh, cognitive simulations. Okay, I took it to another. We took it to another steps and made talking about the simulation. If I can train the brain abilities or the cognitive abilities, why don't we try to simulate the whole cognitive environment of the player in our case? So, first step is to map cognitive skill set to know better what are the cognitive skill set used by the player on the rink, on the ice, whatever, OK? Um, in this case, a basketball. For example, I end coordination, attention, decision making, lots and lots of cognitive skills. Then we have built it uh, to build a game, a video game, but that when playing it, you actually plays, your brain actually plays hockey or basketball. It has nothing to do with basketball and hockey the way it looks. It has almost nothing to do with the dynamics. It has nothing to do with the bird eye view that we are using. You'll see that in a second. But it has to do in one thing. It simulates quite accurately the exact cognitive skill set used by the player itself. Having said that, while playing it, you'll be much better on the ice. Any questions? By the way, you can ask me a question. It's perfectly OK. No? Are you? No? They can't ask me a question or any questions? OK, both, neither, OK. <laughs> well, that's life. OK, so we have, uh, till this now, we understand what is a cognitive trainer. I want now to get a deeper view into how do we make it. OK, so this was cognitive simulation. And let's, let's uh, uh, 
take a deep dive into. First of all, it's communication. Now, communication is very important. As you can easily notice, I love to bring stories from my home. So here's the one for you guys. Sorry, not for you ladies. Um, about a year ago, my wife was mad at me. Well, we argued about something. You know, it happens all the time. And sometimes, not all the time. And she told me that I should, you should know it by yourself. Do you know this sentence, guys? <laughs> you should have understood it by yourself. I shouldn't have been t telling that to you. You should know it by yourself. And then I tried to explain to her and explain to her everything. And she said, you're right. You couldn't know that. But still, I keep the right to be angry at you. OK? So communication is something very, very important. This is something that Danny, which is highly involved in ACE, actually taught me. At the beginning, I must admit, I didn't understand why he's so um, why does he so much emphasize this point? I only understood it much later. But communication is very important. So first of all, we ask hockey coaches, what is hockey? And they say it's all about personality, many personality traits. And it's all the fundamentals, the ability to skate, the ability to pass, to shoot. And it's all about the physical tra traits. Okay, how strong am I, how big am I, and so forth. And what is more important to us is cognitive skills. Now, they didn't know the word cognitive skills. They, they referred it as hockey sense. And since we are talking about hockey, let's see hockey for a second. I think it could be a very good idea. This is someone playing hockey. It's really fast game, okay? You can hardly see the puck unless you are North American, okay? Yes. Yes. That's cool, right? This is hockey. I have tons of this. But hockey is a very fast game. You have to make very short, uh, uh, very fast decision in very short uh, time frames. And if you make uh, something wrong, you get hit by the wall. And it's really, really hurt you. Even though you are very well protected, it's it's really a very physical game and fast game. So the first, uh, the, so the first uh, stage was actually understanding what is this co these cognitive skills are. And while speaking to the coaches, we've got lots and lots of, ah, OK, sorry, in a second. We've got lots and lots of, of insight just by, communi <laughs> just by communicating them. This is, for example, uh, what Hubi Brown, a very, very, um, highly evaluated uh, coach in the state says, in the game of basketball, it is not about who, run, about who runs better or jump higher, but it's about who makes better decisions, and so forth and so forth. So we immediately we understood that it's talking, they are talking about decisions. And they use their special terms. You should hear the music. In basketball, it's called game intelligence. In hockey, they call it hockey sense. And we try to listen to the music, uh, not just for the words. Um, uh, but they kept on telling us, hockey sense is something you are born with. You can't train it. It's something, I mean, you just were born. And if you are good, you're good. And if you are bad, you're bad. This is what Wayne Gretzky, the legendary uh, uh, player on all time, he, he actually has a league by his own, as much as concerned to his real results, said, a good player plays where the puck is. A great player plays where the puck is going to be. And all of a sudden, all of us hear anticipation, right? We hear about uh, your ability to predict what's going on, what's going to be in the game. So we keep on listening to them. We ask them, what is hockey sense? And this is what they say, hockey sense. Finding free ice, execution, grow ice in the back, OK? Using various game strategies and so forth. I'll just make it, OK, it's better now. Um, selection of optimal skating path. All of this is hockey sense. This is what makes you a great hockey player. Now, this is not cognitive-wise. This is just you know, um, uh, uh, coaches-wise. But it's very important to understand that. So if hockey sense is what they want, hockey says, that's what going to get from us. And then we were flies on the wall. Each Saturday night, or almost each Saturday night, the national teams of the Oh, good. OK. It's at the night that uh, um, the national teams under 17 and under 18 years old of US are playing in the league around them. And each Sunday morning, they are making a video analysis of what happened there. They present to the players what were they doing, good or bad, last night. Now we joined 
the coaching team while analyzing these videos. And the only thing that we've done was writing down the sentences that they said. If there are any grammatical mistakes, it's not by me for a, for a change, by them. And this is what they say. Time and space attrition. A player is wide open. That's pretty good, read, uh, read by, her, by Henry. He's got to uh, catching a little more and so forth and so forth. These are all sentences that we took from what they say, which sound to us as something that we can do about cognitive wise. Okay? So this is what they said. But unfortunately, these coaches, players, and parents are not cognitive scientists. So we had to invest a language by ourselves. So do you know this band? No? I'll wake you up a little bit. OK. Do you know them? Do you want to dance? Really? No. OK. 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 You don't know them, right? OK. OK. Uh, this is a great uh, band. I think it's the prototype of all pop music. And we had to invent something like the village people. We call it Pognition, which is popular cognition. OK? Since this point and on, I'm going to use the Pognition term or terminology and not the Cognition terminology. Why is that so? Because you can say working memory to any coach that you want, but he'll kick you out of his office immediately. <laughs> he don't know what do you want from him. Working, I'm at work now. Memory, I remember perfectly where if I parked my car, what do you want from me? OK? So we had to invest a language. It's very important if you want to make a good uh, uh, um, cognitive trainer, and this is a mix between real cognitive terms and something that I have invented for read and react. It's actually there, rapid patterns recognition. That's a nice cognitive skills invented by me, and so forth and so forth, but can all be, be translated easily to cognitive uh, terms. Now, it sounds weird for you, but it's really, really important to talk in the language that your customers may understand, because otherwise, it's not that they won't buy the, your product. You simply won't understand what they are saying to you, and they, they won't understand what you are saying to them. Having said that, we can keep on. And to the second part, how do we learn and analyze what happened over there? Now, there are many, many uh, ways to analyze, and le oh, first of all, to, to learn what is hockey cognitive-wise. First, you just listen to uh, the coaches. The other one is talk to coaches and ask them lots of questions. For example, one fascinating, world, uh, fascinating uh, fact that we have found is that kids who were born um, between, oh, it skipped away from me, that comes to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, with, that goes to school late, or sorry, early at their age, they start to play with the age group which is, for example, the fifth grade, but they start with a very small because they are young. If they are small, they get smashed to the wall at all time. If they want to get smashed to the wall at all time, they must think very fast. If they must think very fast, they must be a better decision makers. And then, at the beginning, they are the worst players on the ice because they are small. And then they become better. And all of a the sudden, when they reach their maturity, because everybody grows at the end, all of a the sudden, bang, they are the best players in town. Why is that so? Because they are both smart, they had to survive, and now they are big and strong. OK? Are you with me? OK, just unbelievable thing that we have learned, um, and many other things that I'm going to, going to present to you in a short time. OK. Another way that we try to look uh, on real life is ignoring this. You know this, right? Yeah. So since we are a commercial firm, we are not obliged for this. I mean, we can use this. It's not a must, I mean. So we can make a research is more free, I think. And I want to present to you uh, one of our research. I'm going to open a video in a short time, sorry. Um, mm -mm. OK. Let's see this one. Yep. Here we go. I do apologize. it? OK. What I've done here, let me just stop it for a second. If I just, OK, this is a very complicated task to look behind, move your mouse. OK. OK, where are we? Where's the mouse? Here's the mouse. Here we go. Sorry, apologize for that. OK, what I've done there as part of my research is give me lots and lots of information. I've asked the, co uh, the, play, the coaches and they agreed to, play, to mount a little camera on their helmets. So now I know what do they look at, okay? 
I didn't make any calculation of the viewing angle, etc. but there's a camera on top of them. And I want to show you uh, the next scene in two speeds, one normal speed and then a slower speed. So let's start it. Okay, this is over his head, okay? He's still on the bench now. Okay, now he's on the ice. Okay, this is the way he moves. Try to see and see the puck. It's always in the middle of the viewing angle. Okay, it's always in the middle, okay? Okay. It's too quiet. At one, he's going to lose the puck, okay? He's got there, okay? In a second, he's got the puck. He's, he possesses it now, and that's it. He doesn't have the puck anymore. Have you seen something? No. Okay, so let's do it. Let's look at it together. Yep. I'll try it by normal speed. Okay, let me just move over here. Okay, number 12 of the opponent. Where is the, oh, I'm going to miss it, right? Sorry, well, just the mouse. Okay, here it is. Okay, I'll just take enough time. Okay, number 12 of their team is going to get the puck. Okay. In a second, you'll see he's got the puck, okay? Not yet. He's passed the puck. Okay, now he's got the puck. Okay, this is number 12. Do you see him? He's right in the center of his viewing angle, okay? Now, he slots a little bit to the left, number 12. He possesses the puck. He's all concentrated in the puck now. He cannot do a very efficient divide, sorry, he can't divide his attention very efficiently. He's all concentrated by the puck. Even though it's in his viewing angle, there's no chance for him to get him. So, here he goes, here it goes, and number 12 now is on his left. Where is it? It's on his left. Here he comes, and he takes the puck from him. Okay, that's it. Okay, and we analyze lots and lots of movies like this. Another example is looking at the strategy by which they seek for information. Here's another example. Where is it? Okay, this is a player in a defense task. Okay, look at the head movement. Do you see that movement? Okay, if something switch, okay, we actually now know how do they acquire information from the environment. We simply see how rapidly do they move their heads, to what angle, what are the, the, what are the angles that they are seeking for information each, and so forth and so forth. And this is a really efficient way to learn what's going on with your players. Okay, so this is, was another way that we could, just a second please, we could collect our information. Do I have till 3.15, right? Uh, yeah, 11 minutes. 11 minutes, ah, cool. Okay, we have learned that hockey is an anaerobic game, actually. <laughs> that it means that when the minute you get into the ice, it takes you up to 60 seconds to get out of the ice. They exchange while playing. Why is that so? Because they skate so fast they can't hold the breath. Now, this is the shape that the coach has described for us. First of all, there's getting into the eyes. Okay, this one. This is about five to 10 seconds. Now, five to 10 seconds sounds like nothing for you, but it's more than 10% of the time I'm on the ice. So if I can improve my performance in this stage, I'm doing something really significant. There is the end of the shift in which I'm totally fatigued, I'm so tired, so I can't do anything at, by the end, okay? If I can improve your cognitive skills, so using your cognitive abilities while you're almost dead, I'm doing something, and needless to say, this is the most important place, improving, taking all of this graph up, okay? And improving their abilities. So this is the main area of potential of improvement, as, as it can be seen. By the way, I hardly found any research with support that when you are under fatigue, your cognitive skills drops. But it's maybe just me that couldn't find one, but I couldn't find anyone, uh, any, any of them. So now we go into the next step, which is connecting the hockey into the cognition, right? We have to connect hockey to cognition. So for example, puck control. Puck control is get the puck, use your stick, skate very fast, decide where you want to go, to see all of the opponents against you, and try to analyze, and this is the cognition analysis of, uh, uh, task of 
pack control, for example, dividing attention, that's the only and the first thing. You have to divide your attention between the pack and what's going around you, even if you're in a, a very expert NHL player. You still find it very hard to do. And you have to use your peripheral view. This is a cognition, a classical cognition uh, term used by the coaches, so I used it as well, and so forth and so forth. Um, and we have to make decision and we have to see, to recognize pattern. But this is just the beginning of the story because we immediately understood that this is only one time frame of, the, of one uh, snapshot of the situation and keeping the task is actually a little flow. For example, you start, you perform tasks uh, skating to the position and building a situation map. All of the coaches told us and players told us as well, I have to build a map inside my head before I get the puck in order to know what to do with the puck and know what do they look at, okay? I didn't make any calculation of the viewing angle, etc. but there's a camera on top of them. And I want to show you uh, the next scene in two speeds, one normal speed and then a slower speed. So let's start it. Okay, this is over his head, okay? He's still on the bench now. Okay, now he's on the ice. Okay, this is the way you move. Try to see and see the puck. It's always in the middle of the viewing angle. Okay, it's always in the middle. Okay. Okay. It's too quiet. At one, he's going to lose the puck. Okay, you've got there. Okay, in a second, you've got the puck. He's he possessed it now. And that's it. He doesn't have the puck anymore. Have you seen something? No. Okay, so let's do it. Let's look at it together. 12 of their team is going to get the puck. Okay. In a second, you'll see he's got the puck. Okay. Not yet. He's passed the puck. Okay, now he's got the puck. Okay, this is number 12. Now, he slots a little bit to the left, number 12. He's possessed the puck. He's all concentrated in the puck now. He cannot do a very efficient divide, sorry, he can't divide his attention very efficiently. He's all concentrated by the puck, even though it's in his viewing angle, there's no chance for him to get him. So, here he goes, here it goes, and number 12 now is on his left. Where is it? It's on his left. Here he comes, and he takes the puck from him. Okay, that's it. Okay, and we analyzed lots and lots of movies like this. Another example is looking at the strategy by which they seek for information. Here's another example. Where is it? Okay. This is a player in a defense task. Okay. Look at the head movement. Do you see that movement? Okay. If something switch, okay, we actually now know how do they acquire information from the environment. We simply see how rapidly do they move their heads, to what angle, what are the, the, what are the angles that they are seeking for information each, and so forth and so forth. And this is a really efficient way to learn what's going on with your players. Okay. So this is, was another way that we could, just a second please, we could collect our information. Do I have till 3.15, right? Uh, 11 minutes. 11 minutes, ah, cool. Okay. We have learned that hockey is an anaerobic game, actually. <laughs> That it means that when the minute you get into the ice, it takes you up to 60 seconds to get out of the ice. They exchange while playing. Why is that so? Because they skate so fast they can't hold the breath. Now, this is the shape that the coach has described for us. First of all, there's getting into the ice. Okay, this one. This is about five to 10 seconds. Now, five to 10 seconds sounds like nothing for you, but it's more than 10% of the time I'm on the ice. So if I can improve, my performance in this stage, I'm doing something really significant. There is the end of the shift in which I'm totally fatigued, I'm so tired, so I can't do anything at, by the end, okay? If I can improve your cognitive skills, so using your cognitive abilities while you're almost dead, I'm doing something, and needless to say, this is the most important place, improving, taking all of this graph up, okay? And improving their abilities. So this is the main area of potential of improvement, as, uh, as it can be seen. By the way, I hardly found any research with support that when you are under fatigue, your cognitive skills drops. But it's maybe just me that couldn't find one, but I couldn't find anyone, uh, any, any of them. So now we go into the next step, which is connecting the hockey 
into the cognition, right? We have to connect hockey to cognition. So for example, puck control. Puck control is get the puck, use your stick, skate very fast, decide where you want to go, see all of the opponents against you, and try to analyze. And this is the cognition analysis of a, a task of Pack control, for example, dividing attention, that's the only and the first thing. You have to divide your attention between the pack and what's going around you, even if you're in a, a very expert NHL player. You still find it very hard to do. And you have to use your peripheral view. This is a cognition, a classical cognition uh, term used by the coaches, so I used it as well, and so forth and so forth. Um, and we have to make decision and we have to see, to recognize pattern. But this is just the beginning of the story because we, immediately understood that this is only one time frame of the of one uh, snapshot of the situation and keeping the task is actually a little flow for example you start you perform tasks uh, skating to the position and building a situation map all of the coaches told us and players told us as well I have to build a map inside my head before I get the puck in order to know what to do with the puck when it's been there Okay, and then getting the puck, taking the switch decision, do I take the puck or pass it? The lower your level is, the more time, the less time you'll keep the puck, because if you keep the puck too much, immediately somebody will get it to you. I don't know if you know, but in a total game time of one hour, on average, you have the puck for two minutes. That's it. All the rest of the time, you're just skating from back and forth. And what I was doing in this stage is mapping all of these stages just simple analysis by me. And then I try to build a load map. Okay, I've divided these skills into few uh, groups, motor aspects, perception, attention, higher than that. Um, I do apologize for the in, uh, incorrect, that not being not that correct cognitive wise, but it was enough for us. And being looking at this, I can see easily that in stage D, for example, I'm highly uh, my brain is really loaded, sorry, it's really busy, and stage D is exactly the stage, perceiving situation pattern change as compared to memory. Okay, I have a memory of the situation, I take the puck, I take my head down to the puck, I skate with it, then I raise my head. Now you see what's going all around me. Now there are two maps, the map that I had before I got the puck, and the map that I have now, and I have to compare these two. Since I have to compare these two, this is something really demanding to do, while keeping the puck with the stick, okay? And this is exactly the place where you lose the puck, typically. I spoke to many coaches, this is exactly the place where you lose the puck. It's not surprisingly, this is the place where your, your mental load is the higher. Right, so this is the, the way we've done it. There are many, many analyses like this in the game. I won't get too much into it because I don't have much time. And then we have the building the game itself, it's the simulation itself. Now building the game sounds like something really simple, right? So cognitive rise is really simple. It's not that complicated. The, prob the problem is with the playability of that. Um, this is just a few sketches. Let's take an example here. Okay, let's assume that I want to, um, to better improve your walking memory and pattern recognition. Uh, sorry about the header, it's not that accurate. Then the game is five by five spaceships trying to, uh, to score, the, uh, to, to blow the other bunker with a bomb and they are flying all around and you try to pass between each other and you try to make a team play in order to get score. Okay, that's very nice. Now if I want to make you think better about patterns, so better acquire better abilities in pattern recognition and your walking memory, I've done one of many manipulations which was, this is one of many manipulations, which was actually hiding the ships. The ships are still playing, they're still moving, they can grab their bomb from you, they can score whatever they want, but you simply don't see them for a few seconds. Having said that, you don't see them for a few seconds, you must anticipate inside your brain, inside your head, where are they and when are, where are they going? Which means that I have to form a pattern, or movement pattern inside your head. This facilitates this creation of pattern movement. And all of a the sudden, they're becoming better with that. People are telling, okay, let's keep with that. I want to show you. I have a little movie here. I hope it will work. Yes, it will work in a second. Just five minutes. Five minutes is a huge amount of time. Okay. And besides, what can you do to me if I won't be? Okay. Um, <laughs>
Somebody should be familiar with that in that room. Sorry. This is not the, the higher speed that uh, we can play. Okay, people are playing. People are playing at speeds which is really unbelievable. So this is the, how the game looks like. Okay, and this is the game. Many many manipulations like this. For example, from time to time, it's the project don't show it correctly. This is me and. I keep hiding what's behind me. So in order to get a good situational awareness, I must rotate in order to acquire information. That teaches them to go behind their back, behind the shoulders, and see what's going over there, and so forth. And the next step is, of course, calibrate. Calibrating such a game, three minutes is usually amount of time. Calibrating is something very difficult, OK? And OK, this is the learning uh, curve, or this is the speeds that we presented to the, to the trainer, trainees. And basically, it has a, a shape of a saw. Why is that so? This is because these are very aggressive kids. And you don't want to, these are basically t TBM classic kids, which is testosterone-based management, um, another term by me. Um, and you don't want to make such a 200 pound player angry at you. So from time to time, you make the game easier for him, right? So that's what we are doing. And then measure. So the proof is in the pudding, finally. OK, the proof in the pudding, OK? That means that if you want to prove, you should, you should show it to me that it worked. Many ways to measure success, but I'll concentrate in a few of them. We are coaching the national American teams with the under 17 and under 18 and 13 gold medals in eight international tournaments, they never had anything like that. This is another example, four years in a row, getting the first prize international. Uh, I'm actually, I'm afraid to go to Canada nowadays um, because Canadians are mad about hockey and they will kill me, literally. And these are the win-lose ratio of the game. This is before the IntelliGym and this is after the IntelliGym and so forth and so forth. And I want to finish with something surprising. As Forrest Gump said, I promise you Forrest Gump, right? OK, Forrest Gump said at the beginning of the movie, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, right? So what? Yep. I don't know if he quoted it. So this is as far as my full memory goes. Uh, but you're right. Um, I'll skip this phone later on. And we found out something very interesting. We found out that they address the physician for physical injuries, much less following the intelligent. This is very interesting. This is before our trainer. This is following our trainer. We didn't mean it to happen, um, but now that you think about it, it's all logical. If they know better way, better way to position themselves, and if they know better what to do, it means that last chance to get hurt by the wall. So it's a good time to, uh, to say thank you, Danny, for all of this. Uh, and don't believe that any of this would be even existing without you. So it's time to conclude. Thank you very much.